Aloha and welcome to Pigments, the Power of Imagination here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'd love to use my radio voice all the way through this episode, but that would wear me out. I'm excited about my time today with my favorite peacenik and new uh, wingman, Christine Ahn, to talk about peace in Korea. This is one of those strange things parts of life where I should have met somebody long ago because we're so focused on a couple things, one piece in Korea and two, the involvement of women in security matters, what I call women, peace and security. And and that was my top priority. But we didn't meet until about two months ago. Christine, on welcome to Figment, the Power of Imagination, my personal webcast. Aloha. Thank you, Dan, for having me. Yeah, it's, um, you're a powerful person, and I'm going to do a little bit of your bio. Folks, just go Google Christine on A-H-N, not like I misspelled it earlier today, A-H-N, and Women Cross DMZ. And you'll see she's the executive director. She's done remarkable things, led uh, 30 women across the DMZ. We're going to talk more about that. Uh, upcoming soon on PBS, there'll be a film called Crossings. I've gotten the chance to preview it because I know Christine. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, but you're you're a force of nature, Christine. That's what I think. What do you think? I think you're a force of nature, Dan. <laughs> so we have that in common, um, that mutual uh, admiration. And we have the same goal, but we come at it differently. So uh, tell me a little about, even though I know the answer, the viewers don't, about your your roots in being part of a big family, an immigrant family. So please share that with the audience, if you don't mind. Absolutely. So I am the youngest of 10 children. We, uh, I was born in Seoul, Korea. In South Korea, I um, am actually from a family of nine girls and one boy. And actually, oh, my mother, <laughs> please, <laughs> not in a Korean patriarchal family. Um, he's the prince. But my mother actually bore 13 children and oh, three man. died uh, because after the Korean War, it was uh, there was so much poverty. It was really a difficult time for South Koreans, well, I mean, Koreans throughout the whole peninsula. Um, and so we immigrated to the U.S. My um, eldest sister actually married an American um, officer, military officer. I think he was mm-hmm. an engineer. I don't know if he was serving, um, you know, at USFK, but I know that uh, he was somehow involved with the military as an engineer. And there's a funny story about my oldest sister who ended up becoming a very successful businesswoman in the U.S. But she, um, I guess when Pan Am first came to South Korea, they they selected two stewardesses or flight attendants. And she was one of the two that they selected oh, wow. because yeah. she could speak English. She was pretty. She was tall enough, not like me. Um, but she turned it down because uh, she said that she wanted to do more and that um, becoming a flight attendant was not going to be able to um, catapult her in doing the big vision that she had. And so she said, I'm marrying an American and I'm going to the United States. So that's basically Uh our um, family story to immigrating here. But you were the youngest and um... I am the youngest. Yes. And you don't have the middle child excuse that I have being the middle of seven. So that is my my, my get out of jail free, free <laughs> card for all of my personal flaws. Uh, but you went to school and what were you doing before you became a peacenik? And you are a peacenik. There is no doubt about that. <laughs> Not a bad thing. but um, I have been an activist my whole life. Um, And I think it's my family's experience, even though, um, you know, I think the the immigrant experience, my parents uh, were born in the 1920s. My mom was Mm -hmm. born in 19. 
29. And so if you know the history of Korea and what happened in the last century, yeah, she was born in a colonized Korea under Japanese occupation and lived a very, uh, very impoverished life and very difficult life. Can I I insert, please, and say that something that everybody who cares about northeast asia matters you know if you think you're a student of it, you can't um, understand where we are now if you don't appreciate the harshness of the japanese occupation of south korea okay or the korean peninsula Not, yes yeah uh, uh, you're right the korean peninsula you, it you can't appreciate where we are now unless you look back honestly at that and that's not a an indictment of the Japanese, but it's a harsh history, really harsh yeah. history. Yeah, thanks so much, Dan. Yeah, so that's the Korea that my parents grew up. They couldn't speak Korean. They had to take Japanese names. Um, and then there was the war and then the life actually under dictatorship in South Korea. And so um, when they came here, you know, they didn't speak English. They didn't really have formal education. And so, you know, it was It was a challenging childhood, I have to say, but they did the best that they could with the limited means. And I think that developed for me a deep sense of empathy for um, people and the kind of gross inequality that we see in this country. Yeah. So it began in this world. (laughs) Right. Thank you. But um, yeah, so that began my journey in sort of working for social justice. And then it really wasn't until I was a graduate student at Georgetown. Um, I believe you might have connected with Peter Hayes. He's the um, energy expert from Mm -hmm. Australia who won the MacArthur Genius Award for his work building the windmills in North Korea. And I connected with him and moved from Washington, D.C. to Berkeley, where I worked with the Nautilus Institute. Where my daughter went to university, by the way. Oh, so she has some peacenik groups in her, too. (laughs) Uh, I don't know. She was an Air Force officer who served in Iraq and Afghanistan and Qatar and Gitmo. So she's a good human being, but a different background. Yes, vastly. Um, So, yes, that's my my, um, introduction to Korea. And I just felt that once I started to learn that, history that is not taught taught in this country Mm -hmm. um i felt this responsibility as a u.s citizen of korean descent to help bring closure to this war this war that has not yet ended so where 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 we connect because i come at it differently from two tours in korea and 33 years in the military and facing a, a north korean threat that was absolutely legitimate and a North Korean government that's done some really bad stuff. But knowing, you know, I, I've gotten to this point where I think we absolutely have to make peace and recognize that it's more about peace between peoples than governments. And that we have to put people first and and get this done. Um, but you've got well, street Dan, cred. How did Go ahead. you? Well, how did you come to that position as somebody that was the deputy yeah. commander of Pacific Command that served as the colonel of U.S. Forces Korea for five years. How, I mean, when I, when you first sent the email to me, I could not believe it. And then I did my own little Googling. And then I actually wrote to Anne Wright to say, should I meet is this, this guy? Is this guy for this, real? <laughs> is this legit? And she wrote, she called me right back and she said, Christine, uh, this is no joke. He is for real. And uh, then we quickly both proceeded to read your excellent paper that was um, that received the award from the Oslo Peace Process. And uh, let me tell that that would be an urgently practical approach to the Korean Peninsula. Uh, an Oslo Forum Peace Writer Prize winning paper. Yeah. yeah, I couldn't believe it. So how did you arrive at this position? Um. It didn't start as a colonel or a general. It started as a lieutenant and going to Korea in 1978. Uh, And that was a very different, hard scrabble. Lots of dirt roads, very few privately owned cars, uh, place, a harsh existence. It was a harsh existence for South Koreans. It was not an easy existence 
existence for the American military. Um, and I was there when Park Jung Hee was murdered um, and went through all that turmoil. There, there are many um, threads that connect me to Korea that I can't explain that just kind of happened, but I built a sense of the place and an affection for the people and the culture that I wouldn't have expected. And, and then another thing happened. I read a book. Weird, right? For a fighter pilot, I actually read a book. And I read the book, um, Nothing to Envy, Ordinary Life in, in uh, North Korea by Barbara Demick. And having seen the miracle that evolved in South Korea that was not easily accomplished in any manner, I just got this seed of what it's like to be a North Korean average citizen in my brain and a sense of tragedy that that haunts me. I mean, it just haunts me. So I'd like to fix it. I can't fix it myself. And as I said during our, our initial discussion, I've been baying at the moon for, by myself for, for years. And then I met you. And because you have the credibility of decades, almost, I think, of activism on this matter, when you and I connected, you got me into uh, in contact with the New York Times, and I was able to publish my, I have to throw in front page, thought piece in the New York Times. Um, but that's because of your connections. So back at you, Christine, how did you get so credible? And I, the, I'm not asking you to brag, I'm asking you to explain because you have unique credibility on this matter, on peace in Korea. Uh, you've written a lot, you're interviewed a lot, you have connections in the media, you have a political standing, you've earned awards. Google it, folks, Christine on. Um, how did that happen? How, how did you get such cachet? Hmm, I don't know if it's cachet, Dan, but um, I have been at it for a really long time. I am a Taurus. I feel very persistent and dogged in my determination. I am like you. I feel like once you see something that um, must be fixed, that could impact millions of people, um, I'm going to do what I can. And I would say that, um, you know, having visited North Korea during, in 2004 was my first mm -hmm. trip to North Korea, where um, that was during the axis of evil. And I think the Korean American community was very concerned that North Korea was potentially the next target for regime change. Um, I have, you know, visited North Korea actually eight times. I've traveled pretty extensively wow. throughout the country uh, to cooperative farms, to really remote places. And I've seen the, um, the real hardship that the North Korean people endure. So I'm with you in terms of uh, why does this have to be the case and what can we do to improve the situation? But I've also been to South Korea, and this is maybe where you and I maybe diverge in our um, understanding. But, you know, having, I would say, one of the most formative experiences for me was in 2006 when I traveled to South Korea to Pyeongtaek, which is, as you know, the mm -hmm. world's largest military base. It's the, you know, size of maybe three central parks. Um, and you know, as part of the U.S. realignment on the Korean Peninsula, um, as the two Koreas were in their sunshine policy, uh, there was a, a dramatic expansion of Camp Humphreys. And I could see the impact of that on ordinary people, on the farmers, the, the elderly rice farmers who had cultivated that land for three generations. Um, and, you know, they fought. They fought nonviolently to prevent that expansion. And so I could just see the ways in which the ongoing war, the unresolved war, had continued to lead to more militarization of the Korean Peninsula. And that led to such unnecessary suffering, not just of the North Korean people, but so many 
hundreds of thousands of Korean families that still remain divided, including Korean American families. And so I just, um, I feel that my experiences of going on the ground, um, having studied obviously US policy on North Korea and and in South Korea, um, I just, I can't close my eyes. And I feel that there is another way forward than the way that the U.S. has has dealt this dealt with this issue. So the expansion of Young Tech was part of the move to relocate the headquarters from Yongsan. So the residents of Yongsan in metropolitan Seoul may have a different view than the farmers in Young Tank, Young Tech, just south of Botan, where I spent two years as a young lieutenant and captain. Um, so let me ask a quite a, a difficult prickly question that maybe can't be answered but whose fault is this whose fault is this is this north korea south korea the us's that we're in this still in this place or does the blame matter whose fault is this in your mind i would say it doesn't matter Good. i would say Good. that the more we dwell on that question the more we are not getting to problem solving. And yeah. I think that we all have, all three parties are to blame. There have been, you know, well-documented instances of the US reneging, North Korea reneging. Um, and I think yeah. the bottom line is, is we need a new approach. And I think um, some of the points that you laid out in your paper um, with the Oslo forum is, uh, exactly what needs to happen. I think the points that you make in the New York Times op-ed about the need to have a genuine reconciliation process right. that uh, we can work on such difficult issues such as, and maybe they're not so difficult, and I'd love to hear your perspective as a high-ranking military, former high-ranking military officer mm -hmm. about um, something that would benefit everybody, which is some kind of military to military um, yeah. diplomacy, because there is none. And right now, the US has depended on Sweden as uh, its liaison with the North Koreans. And, you know, I think the point that I found really interesting is that, you know, of the countries that participated in the UN command, um, all but the US and France have normalized relations with the DPRK. Um, and so what are we doing? What are we waiting for? Yeah. Why, why isn't it in American interest to bring an end to this war? Well, I think it is. I just don't think it's been the, the highest interest. You know, as you and I have discussed, the, the preeminent goal during the first 40 years of the armistice was containment in a Cold War sense. And the Cold War was real, you know. It really did exist, and it really was a, a standoff between um, the Soviet Union and everybody who might be affiliated with it and the West, U.S., NATO. Um, and so trying to keep a lid on the war that hadn't ended, that was the goal. After the demise of the Soviet Union, it got more complicated, and it shifted to denuclearization. Or uh, rather, I should say, to stopping nuclear advancement. All of the other issues were viewed as ancillary. You know, the human rights in the South, human rights in the North, um, the eventual starvation in North Korea, all the provocations that, you know, there's a long list of 350 plus incidents uh, from 1960 on. So, with all of that on the table, peace. The making of peace never became the priority. It should be. And I do think that military to military communication is part of it. I think, as, as I said in my article and I've said on Figments before, we got to, <laughs> ending the war is really important. But the military to military communication is, is essential in a, in a real sense, not in a, in a transformational sense, not in a transactional sense. And one of my best friends in, in the world is a North, formerly North Vietnamese, now Vietnamese uh, fighter pilot, retired three stars, shot down six of our airplanes um, during the war, including 
a guy I flew F fours with, whose son later worked for me. So there's uh, this thread of humanity that goes through it. But the first time I met Nguyen Duc Swat, uh, when we were both three stars on active duty, uh, my boss, four star admiral, can, uh, acknowledged his distinguished combat record when we greeted him at Camp Smith. And uh, SWAT said through his interpreter, thanks, but I'm here to talk about the future, not the past. Mm -hmm. We can do both. By talking about the past, by sharing our perspectives, honestly, as military men and women, uh, we can move to the future. And if we don't do that, that, that is part of the solution. I and agree. It's part of the humanity to it because there, you know, war can be fundamentally inhumane. But if the experience of combat doesn't make you more human, then that's a problem. So, um, let me ask. There's so much I want to talk about, and over the over the next five or ten years, when we're solving this problem together, uh, there, there's so much I want to ask you about, but. Do you think that rapid reunification is part of the solution? We haven't, I haven't asked you that before. So how do you feel about reunifying North Korea and, and South Korea in a rapid manner? Is that possible? Is it advisable? What's the dealio? I, my take is that the two Koreas are so different and mm. that 70 years of um, being not just living separately, but they haven't even peacefully coexisted. And so to assume mm. a rapid reintegration and reunification is not realistic. And I think ultimately um, in 2000, when Kim Dae-jung, the former president of South Korea, and Kim Jong-il, Kim Jong-un's father, right. signed the June 15th declaration, they said, we will begin the process of reunification and there are three core components of that. One is the economic integration, which they set up Kaesong using South Korean capital um, and North Korean labor, where they built that joint economic zone, which sadly today uh, is no longer in existence. Yeah, but the economic integration, the family reunions and civil society engagement. And I think during that decade of Sunshine Policy, over a million South Koreans actually visited North Korea. I mean, yes, it was often in um, very contained environments, such as Mount Gunggong, like a tourist site. Um, but that's still meeting and that's still interacting. And unfortunately, yeah. we have regressed so far backwards, um, and not just in terms of South and North Korea, but also on the U.S. side. I mean, you know, unfortunately, well, yes, the last three years of the pandemic, North Korea has definitely sealed off its borders. but even preceding that in 2017, you know, when when we did the DMZ crossing, I didn't need to get uh, permission from the U.S. government to go to North Korea. Um, I we could go as as uh, we had to get the visa from the North Koreans. But now, because Trump put in a travel ban on Americans in the wake of Otto Warmbier's death, um, it's really difficult. And you know, people like you and I, Dan. We need to be able to go to North Korea to meet the North Korean people, to meet with uh, such committees like the, um, for me, the Overseas Korean Committees, but also the, uh, the National Peace Committee of Korea, the Democratic Women's Union of North Korea. There's so many points where we actually just need to meet them and to hear their perspective. And, you know, I mean, that DMZ crossing in 2015. Yes, it was very quick. We weren't in North Korea more than five days. But even the opportunities, Gloria Steinem having frank discussions with her counterpart, um, me having very intense debates with my um, quote unquote minder. Um, when would you have that opportunity otherwise? It's so yeah, important to have uh, the people to people connection. And I, I can be angry about Otto Warmbier's death. And still think that we have to interact with North Korea. It, the two are not exclusive. Yes. I mean, um, we can still protest and uh, regret and, and 
everything else about the young man's death and recognize that there's a higher calling here. And the higher calling involves millions of lives. The millions of lives affected by ordinary life in North Korea that Barbara Demick wrote about and the potentially millions and millions of lives uh, affected by the possible threat of nuclear war, people. In North Korea. So I, I, we're going to run out of time long before I'm done. So maybe you'll come back and join me, uh, Christine. But watching Crossings, and I hope when it makes it to PBS soon that all of you will watch it. Um, it it's a powerful piece in a variety of ways. First of all, as I mentioned to you earlier, uh, I was really impressed impressed with Gloria Steinem, about whom I knew almost nothing, because I didn't need her to tell me to respect the role of women in society and in life and all that. So I, I never paid attention. Remarkable life. Don't have to agree with much or anything or everything. Uh, so folks, do a little research and, and learn about a remarkable human. But, okay, how can I say this as a fighter pilot? As the leader of a very diverse group of 30 Asian, American, Caucasian, African women um, in this remarkably sensitive environment, as a leader, you kicked ass. Sorry, I have to say you, I mean, when I watched that, that you you kept a purposeful endeavor on track by leading people. Well, what do you say to that? Thank you. It'd be fine. But what do you how did you do that? Was it your sense of purpose or? I just I think that when you bring together seasoned women who um, understand the need to build consensus yeah. to hear each other out, that much easier. There's less ego involved. Um, it wasn't easy, but uh, I think, yeah, you totally. know, my being the youngest of 10 kids and having nine girls in my family, I got on the ground training. And so I think somehow um, allowing everybody to express their wishes and hopes and, and desires, but just remembering, we why are yeah. we here? Why are we doing this? And, um, you know, what we do is not just for ourselves, but it's for the Korean people. It's for American people. It's for world peace. And right. Um, and, 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 yeah. and I would, I'd suggest that big families, as a veteran of one of those, build life skills. And I don't know how you, they do. We have got zero seconds left, but we're going to go over just a bit so I can answer, ask you to answer two questions, then give you time for one of me, a question for me. Um, what did you learn from your interaction and your visits to North Korea with, I'll say, average North Koreans, not the government? I would say that they um, have curiosity about the rest of the world and that they are just like you and me. They have the same hopes and wishes to... Okay. Um, raise their children and live a life of dignity. They're like human beings. So I was going to ask about the government of North Korea, but Ash, our erstwhile engineer, is saying we've got a hard stop. So what would you ask me before we go? Because we're going to do this again, and we're going to work together and make a difference um, as unindicted co-conspirators. One more question over to you. What would you ask? Uh, well, I mean, Dan, I'm curious... Having served in the U.S. military, having um, represented the U.S. Pacific Command, I mean, I, it's so wild to me because I am a peace activist. And I feel like because I'm a peace activist and because I'm a woman and because I'm kind of, um, you know, not affiliated with the academic institution or whatever i have it's so funny that you're like oh you have all this cachet and i'm like you have all this cachet and no you have all this cachet. three-star general general but it's like how do you drill into the minds of somebody like ed case who represents us and i think hawaiians and people in hawaii feel um the most urgency of the need to get to peace with north korea given the false missile alert and how that's so frequent us out Ed, Ed so Case being a congressman yeah so yes how do, so how do you and he's a great guy 
Um, yeah. So what what it, will it take? I mean, how do you well, convince takes, somebody like that? It takes um, drill, boiling it down to the most simple, basic questions, and and those are. Are you for or against nuclear war? I'm against it. I have yet to find somebody who would say they're for it. And North Korea is the most dangerous case. Are you for or against uh, the unnecessary suffering of millions of North Koreans? Um, I'm against it. Haven't heard anybody say, oh, yeah, that's great. And when you get to that, now you figure out what's the way to do that. The way to do that is to get a peace treaty. And this then start everything else. And it is that simple. And it's hard work, but it's not as hard as nuclear war. And it's not as hard as being in North Korea right now. So let's get after it. Let's not make it. Let's stop making excuses or putting it off to prank because we don't have time. And I am sure that Ash wants us to wrap up. The great folks here at Think Tech Hawaii make this possible. Christine, I'll see you again soon in many ways, and we'll work together and fix it, as I said. Folks, please remember that Think Tech Hawaii is an awesome nonprofit that enables citizen journalists like me to uh, try to make a difference in our own way. Mahalo and aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.